Well, it's uh, seven o'clock straight up. So let's go ahead and get started. We are right in the middle of the season. This is week five. Uh, all the preliminaries are over and we're getting into the part of the season that at least during my days on the field was the most exciting, but also the most challenging because uh, it, it, everything is bigger and, and things are more at stake than they were earlier in the year. Uh, you've got teams that are undefeated that are attempting to stay that way so that they have home field advantage. You have others that are fighting to get into the playoff picture. And then you have others that are trying to get that first victory and try to get some satisfaction out of the season. So uh, there's always lots of challenges out there and we have to be prepared every night and we have to bring our best effort every time we step out there, not only individually, but especially as a crew. So uh, I, first of all, I want to thank the people that are submitting clips. It certainly makes this job just a little bit easier when I'm seeing action from around the state and things that have come up in your games uh, and then work those in with things that I see during my video review. So please continue to do, do that and we will continue to support you uh, when you do uh, as we've asked you to do. So. Um, I want to talk real quick about something before we get to the video and and maybe it's just coincidence i don't know but it, maybe it goes right along with where we are in the season but uh, this past week i'm aware of at least three inadvertent whistles that we had in games now not all of them were involved with semso they were around the state but uh, that makes me wonder if our concentration is where it needs to be. And from the standpoint of the deep three, for sure, uh, you should not be working with the whistle in your mouth. Now, some of you may go ahead and do that anyway. Um, I would say that better for you uh, to have that whistle in your hand, probably your left hand, so that you know where it is to go from here to here. Um, but think of your whistle uh, in your mouth as a hand grenade. And when you put the whistle in your mouth, in effect, what you've done is you've pulled the pin. And, and um, any soldier will tell you that they don't pull the pin until they're ready to throw the grenade, or in our case, blow the whistle. So um, we need to see leather. And that's another principle, regardless of where you are in the field. And sometimes no whistle is the best whistle, just remembering that the play by rule kills itself, that the whistle is only really for uh, the aid and comfort, if you will, of the players, that by rule, the, the plays actually end. So talk about that, think about that, um, try to avoid, let's get rid of those inadvertent whistles during week five. Alrighty, um, we're gonna spend a little time, in fact, the first clip I believe will be on model huddle, we, um, every year when coaches go to clinics, they come back and it depends a lot who was at the clinic and what they're pushing in a, in a given year. We've had years where the quick kick uh, was very, very popular after uh, coaches clinics. We've had years where short kicks were very popular. This year, it seems that the off season discussion must have been about huddle, muddle huddle because it seems like we're seeing more of those across the state. Uh, the, at least in recent memory. So um, we've talked about it a little bit. And just to review one more time, we don't assume that we're going to have a one-point try when Team A scores. We need to hang back, start looking for the Team A sideline. Uh, and through our scouting, we should know who the kicker and holders are by number. So when we see them coming out, that would be one indication, not the whole picture, because they could be part of a regular formation, either to begin with or maybe to run a play. Uh, but that certainly would be an indication that, that we ought to be aware of. Uh, so when they come out, we don't need to immediately bring the side judge in as the double umpire. For that matter, we don't need the field judge to immediately come under one of the uprights. Um, we should hang back. We'll still have plenty of time uh, to get to our positions if we'll just be patient. 
So in this particular case, we have, uh, if you go back to the beginning of the clip, Gregor. All right, so what we have here is a modified muddle. Many times we'll see the muddle huddle will be closer to the sideline. Now we have a kicker and holder in place. Um, so we do need to treat it as if it's going to be a one point attempt, which means field judge should be under the upright. Um, and the side judge should uh, should come in. All right, so that's really all we need to do here on this clip. Uh, they shifted, kicked, made a one point attempt, and away we go. So that was for illustration. All right, the next clip um, should be number 71. Now, what we're going to get here, um, we're going to get a foul down for early contact on a pass that's going to come to the bottom of the screen. Now, this is a five-person game, but the principles are still the same, right? So this player at the bottom of the screen is going to run a fade, and the quarterback is going to slightly underthrow. But what you see here is not really as clear as I would like it to be. But what you're going to get is that the defensive back never plays the ball. Uh, now, as we've talked about, that's not a category for DPI. We have to have a mitigating uh, category that goes along with not playing the ball. In this case, it would be early contact. Now, the ball is not perfectly thrown. So here, the, the back judge and if we had the deep wing, the deep wing would have to make a determination without the contact, could the receiver have come back and potentially caught the ball? Now here the pass is to towards the center. He's trying to make a move towards the center of the field to try to make a catch, and he never has the opportunity because of the contact of the defense. However, if you have a badly thrown ball that comes up short that he can't possibly get to, then we're just going to make that incomplete and roll the down box to the next down. All right, next clip should be a combination. You know, uh, you've heard me talk a few times about the back judge staying out of forward progress. What we're going to get is we're going to get a play that's going to come up the field. Um, and for a, a pretty nice game. Now, first of all, uh, the back judge checked up a little bit quick here, assuming that the runner was going to be tackled. That's a fundamental mistake. We need to continue with our retreat and to defend the goal line until he physically is down. But the bigger problem is that the back judge wants to come up, get the ball, spot the ball, or hand the ball to the umpire, or whatever we have. And by now, you should know that that's a no-no. Let the umpire do his job. Let him get the forward progress spot from the uh, short wings or the deep wing, as the case may be. Um, we may give uh, oral instructions, verbal instructions, put it on the 14 or whatever it happens to be. But we want the back judge to stay in position to officiate his his uh, next responsibility. Now, in this this is towards the end of the half, and what the you can see the offense is hurrying to the line. Now, what they end up doing here, and if you roll it to the next play, they spike the ball to stop the clock. All right. So the back judge somewhat get gets bailed out. You can see he's midway in the end zone. Uh, I don't know if he's assuming this is going to be a spike or what but we're really not ready. Okay, so let's say that this clip that you have up right now does not happen and we go to 76, the next clip. So what I'm trying to get you to do is to mentally think as if this is the next play after the back judge uh, came up and spotted the ball and he was midway in the end zone. All right, we've got a deep fade that goes to the back corner. This is why we have to be prepared to officiate and why we need to stay out of forward progress. If you remember earlier this year, I showed a play where the back judge literally was on the run trying to get back into position because he wanted to come up and spot the ball. Don't do that. Stay out of it. Let the other people do their jobs. All right, next clip. Um, we're going to have, this is a two-point attempt, all right? Now watch number three at the bottom of the screen. A 
Okay. Now, um, the question here, is this OPI? You can clearly see that he seeks out this guy and you can see at the last moment, uh, he kind of turns to the side. He never is looking back at the quarterback. Now, if he comes out here and after a couple of steps, turns around, faces the quarterback is a legitimate threat to catch the football. All right, the contact there on the part of that defender, if any, would be uh, incidental. But here, clearly he's seeking him out. The shoulder is used to kind of pick this guy off. He's really not a legitimate uh, receiver. The, the intent of this to in, is in, to impede, and therefore there should be a foul down for OPI. All right. Now, there's some subtleties here. And yes, there is a way to legally pick. And that is somewhat what I just described. If you get to a place, uh, you get there first, a basketball principle, you know, you get to the spot on the floor, or in this case, to the turf uh, first, and you are legitimately in a position to catch the ball from the quarterback if he chooses to throw it to you. All right, now you're in legal position. But clearly here, that's not what this wide receiver number three is doing. He's down there with the idea that I'm going to pick off this guy that's supposed to defend um, going outside. All right. So that's a foul for OPI. Put the flag down um, and justice will be served. All right. Last clip of this particular group is 126. What we want to look at here is goal line and end line mechanics. We're going to get a pass that's going to go deep into the end zone. Now, again, this is a five person game. Let's put a deep wing over there at the goal line. Uh, we're snapping from about the 35. So this should develop for the deep wing fairly quickly. He should retreat to goal line extended and be prepared to rule on the sideline. Now, this happens to threaten the sideline more than it does the end line, all right? So the primary here is going to be the deep wing, whether it be field judge or side judge. The back judge is going to be in a supportive role, uh, perhaps providing information, but we want that back judge to get to the end line and get stationary. You can see we're in cruise mode here by the back judge. And we take this play on the run as opposed to working, uh, committing to our cushion, if you will, getting to that end line, setting up shop, and being prepared to receive this play. We have some plays uh, from the Utica Eisenhower, and uh, let's see, they played Anchor Bay game, uh, red, white, and blue game. Um, so this first clip is um, is going to be about foul selection. What we're going to have is down here at the bottom of the screen, you can see we get lock up here on the part of the, uh, the wide receiver. Um, and he has him locked up to the point where this when this runner goes outside, there is no chance for this defensive back to be able to to play, to make a play on this now. The point that we made last week that's very, very important is <clears throat> had this running back caught up inside of his teammate, we probably don't have a foul in that wide receiver. Now, in this particular case, he chose to go outside because you can see the pursuit is there. And if he cuts it up, that guy's probably going to make the tackle. But this is a correct call for holding by the wide receiver. Now, this flag comes from our short wing. This is a primary coverage area, at least by initial key, uh, for our deep wing. And we should have, well, there goes the flag. So it's late, but we got one down. Now, the thing that we need to do that we talked about during the summer is multitasking. We need to continue with our progression downfield with our cushion at the same time refereeing our, our key, which was the wide receiver. Now, don't try to stop, turn around, and make a perfect throw to second base with your flag. What we need to do is simply get the flag on the way, make a mental note in terms of the spot of the foul, 
and continue with your job of maintaining cushion. You can see that the deep wing comes back and makes a flag adjustment. Um, unfortunately, we lost too much time and consequently we got beat uh, unnecessarily because of the other part of the dual uh, responsibility we had on that play. All right, uh, next clip. Um, this is not specific uh, to deep wings, but understand uh, when we talk about the line to gain and being decisive, here's an example of uh, two line of scrimmage people that did a really, really good job. See that line of scrimmage guy at the bottom? He knows that the line to gain has not been achieved on fourth down and gives a decisive forward progress spot as well as folks that ball is going the other way. Everyone in the place, from the grandma in the top row to the coaching staff to the bus driver to everybody else, knows what happened here. That's the kind of officiating that we need to do. Um, you can see that we have a good job by the opposite short wing mirroring that spot. We stop the clock because it's fourth down. It's going to be first down for someone, and it happens to be for team B. So very well done, particularly after a discussion last week about being decisive around the line to gain and knowing. The other part of this is that both of these people know where the front stick lies, and they know that unless that ball carrier gets to the 16-yard line, uh, it's going to go run down. So that's a part of your pre-snap routine. So just wanted to show that uh, in, in comparison to what we talked about last week with some indecision. Okay. Um, now we go to clip 36, Gregor. As you know, we do not have substitution mechanics in in high school football in college football the umpire would be up or the center judge would be up over this ball preventing the snap from occurring until team b has the opportunity to match up what i'd like you to notice team b did a nice job getting out there but if we go back to the beginning of this clip look how quickly we put this ball down so in our cruise we need to talk um in terms of being in a position to officiate umpires uh, before you set the ball down, what you should really do is to take a quick look behind you to make sure that the deep three are at least near their positions that you think they ought to be to receive this punt. Likewise, that the line of scrimmage people are facing you. If you remember last week, we had a clip where our short wing had his back to the snap when it occurred. So those are things we can avoid. Those are things that we can handle from a crew perspective. If the umpire will just be patient, remember all we're looking to do is to have the ball on the ground between uh, 32 and 28, okay? So we don't need to hurry the ball in. You can see team B just got that 11th player onto the field. And if you look closely, the deep wing at the top of the screen was clearly indicating he had 10. He had 10 fingers up. I don't have 11. I have 10. So we were aware deep that Team B initially was short. Now, he just barely gets onto the field, number two. He's onto the field, um, you know, a good couple of yards before the snap occurs. Now, we should know that if he enters the field after the snap, we've got a foul. We got a foul for illegal participation. Um, but here he gets on the field on his side of the line of scrimmage, so we're good to go. Now, uh, that may require some coordination between the short wing and the deep wing, depending on where that bench is. We know that the deep wing is primarily responsible for players coming off the field. Likewise, there should be an awareness, particularly when you know that you only have 10, you should be looking for the possibility of that late substitute, but we may need to figure that out after the fact if necessary. But this will go much, much smoother if we can just have the umpire hold onto the ball a couple of beats longer to make sure that we have the crew ready to go, which will give team B a little more time to get organized and get the right people on the field. 
All right, uh, next one should be number 97. I want to talk a little bit about uh, blocks in the back. What we're going to get at the top of the screen is we're going to get a formed up block and there's contact that's maintained there. So um, this really would not have been a block in the back anyway because there was continuous contact. But what I would like you to do is to imagine where this defender gets around, this defensive back gets around the blocker, and clearly the blocker is now in chase mode, like we talk about with punts. Let's say that that blocker pushes him into the tackle, like what happened here. That is a foul we do not want called, because in effect, what he did was to put the guy that technically got fouled into the tackle, and that's not a flag that we need to have. Justice was served on the basis of the fact that the play was made. All right, next clip. We're going to look at some punt mechanics. So we're snapping from about the plus 43, so we know that the goal line is potentially in play. All right, now notice that our deep start coming off of the goal line prematurely. There is no hurry whatsoever to leave the goal line. Stay there. Keep your angles so that um, we get the best look at the kick perhaps being touched or uh, muffed by team B if you, potentially coming up trying to field the ball. We don't need to hurry coming off the goal line. We're going to put it on a yard line to begin with anyway, unless we end up with the ball uh, being downed inside the one yard line, then it needs to go exactly where it was downed. But here we move up too quickly. That's dangerous. We want to stay back and make sure that we don't hurry to that forward progress spot. All right, next clip, uh, 126. Now, we don't really need to look at this play in, in great detail, but if you look at the deep wing at the top of the screen, there are two people within six feet of him. Now, I don't know who those people are. I don't know if they're relatives, friends, uh, game administration, whoever they are, they don't belong that close to our official. We want them back behind the limit line out of the way. They should not be a distraction to anyone over there. Again, regardless of who it is, maybe it's maybe it's the uh, police officer that has responsibility for that side of the field, and he wants to be chatty. Okay, you know we can talk with that individual after the game or at the quarter or some other time. We have to have our focus out there on the field. So don't let that happen to you. All right, next clip. Um, this one. Um, I just want to touch here. We're expecting a short kick, right? So if you go back here, we have six in the box. Now, if this kick goes deep, which it does, then the two judges, the side judge and the field judge, will commit to getting some depth to get down here to assist the referee with what's going to happen in terms of the recovery uh, and perhaps advance of the kick uh, on a return. So what should happen here is that at the bottom of the screen, let's see, this is late in the game, so we'll call this the field judge. When the field judge sees that this kick is going deep, boom, he heads down there and tries to get some depth. Uh, you can see this kick ends up uh, just short of the goal line. They field it, and they end up, with um, a long field because of it. But that leaves the referee down there pretty much by his lonesome. And in that scenario, we can get down there and provide some support. Now, what do the other two people do? Well, the umpire and the back judge are going to do exactly what they do on every other deep kick. They're going to get in between the numbers and the hash mark and work inside out. The two line of scrimmage people are, in effect, going to perform the duties of the two deep wings. They're going to come down a short distance, set up, and watch from the outside in that zone for blocking during the return. The deep wing 
will perform or hopefully get down there in time to somewhat perform the duties that the short wing would typically do if we were in regular kick formation. All righty. Um, Gregor, I believe that's the end of uh, group two. So let's go to MHSAA football officials. All right, this first play is uh, going to be an example of really, really good judgment by the deep wing at the top of the screen. You can see that we get uh, a hotly contested pass where the defensive back is in press coverage. There's a little bit of contact, as you will see. But the defensive back, you can't play defensive back much better than this. You know, he's playing the football. That's just that's just a great play, um, and we don't want to. We certainly don't want to nitpick this. Uh, this would be way too technical. Um, actually, that pass might have been close to the line of scrimmage, so potentially the short wing might have come up and said, "If you have DPI, you know that contact and that pass was." Uh, behind the line of scrimmage, which is going to negate the flag anyway. But the key point here is um, there's nothing taken away from this receiver. Uh, it's just a great defensive play. All right, next clip. All right, here, this, this is an unusual play. Let's go back to the snap. Let's go back to the snap. All right, so this is fourth down. Team A is in scrimmage kick formation or close to it. Um, everybody on the field is thinking that this is going to be a kick play. So everybody's mind has shifted away from scrimmage plays. And now we're thinking about those rules that are applicable to scrimmage kicks. Well, you know, everything works until it doesn't. And in this particular play, what we're going to end up with is a botch snap. And the intended punter is going to be within the tackle box um, and ends up throwing a pass, which does not make the line of scrimmage, nor does it, is there a receiver in the area. So now we can let it run. Clearly short. The closest player to that was number 51. All right. So if you are a short wing and you see this happen, you should say to yourself, hmm, something in right here. That doesn't look quite right. Um, and finish the play by all means. First of all, I'd be slow with my whistle as a short wing just to make sure that the referee doesn't have a fumble. But once the referee blows the whistle or it's clear this play is dead, all right, now I'd be headed towards the referee as the short wing at the top of the screen. Mr. Referee, that pass did not make it to the line of scrimmage and there was not an eligible receiver in the area. Now, from a referee perspective, he needs to make a mental note of approximately where that pass was released in the event this becomes an issue. But Grounding, regardless if it's from regular scrimmage formation or something like this, is a joint responsibility between um, often, most often, the short wing, sometimes the deep wing, depending on where the quarterback is, if he is within the pocket, and whether, like, the pass is thrown downfield, is there a receiver in the vicinity downfield? And then the deep wing or perhaps even the back judge would get involved in that conversation. But here we don't put the principal parts of this together. We simply go with fourth down. And we go back to the previous spot and give team B the ball first and 10. All right, so what really should have happened here is we should have gone to the spot of this pass and fouled this for intentional grounding five yards from the spot of the foul loss of down. So team B would have got the ball probably about 15 yards closer to where they ended up getting the ball. But these are the kinds of things we have to be alert to. And of course, during the summer, when we're talking about these things, 
in relation to, you know, you may have to transition your thinking from a kicking play to a scrimmage play or vice versa. Well, here is the poster child and the fact that uh, we need to be prepared to do it. So um, who knows whether this will come up again this season. I would hope that if it does, we would handle it um, properly with the communication so that the referee can make an informed decision in terms of what he wants to do with this particular pass. All right, next clip. All right, um, what we need to talk about here is once again, our coordination between the short wing and the deep wing. Now we're snapping from about the eight yard line. So prior to the snap, there should have been communication on both sides of the field. If, if I'm the deep wing, I'm saying, John, Fred, Susie, I'm here. It's yours to the two. Every, every play, every time that we're this close to the goal line, that conversation should take place. Your spot to the two. I am at the goal line. So when this play happens towards the top of the screen, the person that's going to call the ball literally is going to be the deep wing. The deep wing is going to need to make a determination. Is this progress spot at the two or in? If that's the case, then like in the outfield between outfielders, mine, 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 mine. I got the spot. And then the deep wing comes up, squares it off, has progress. Here we've got, I believe they made the line to gain, so we'd be stopping the clock for a first down, right? If it's short of the two, you're saying yours, yours, your spot, your spot, your spot. And then if necessary, deep wing, you're going to say, put it on the three. You're going to help out your partner over there by sharing that information. But Another piece that we should be communicating, if not every week, on a regular basis, and then follow through during the game according to the mechanics. Hey, Rich, okay. uh, can I ask a yeah. question? Please. Looking at the screen here on this play, I don't see a back judge. Were they running just six men without running a back judge, no one covering the end line on this play? I, I believe that was the case. Wow. Sounds like Gary. It's Gary. Yes, it is. Okay, Gary. Yeah, good pickup. Um, the applicable part of it was the coordination, but you're right. They were going six. So um, that's challenging. And with injuries and uh, the number of games from time to time, we have to go six people. Uh, sure. So that's something that we need to prepare for. All right, okay. next clip should be... Um, Okay, all right, we'll go with this. All right, now what we have here, uh, we're, we're gonna have a contested pass down around the goal line. So we know that our deep wings are gonna be on the goal line, and this is not a typical kind of a play, but the fact that we're in proper position gives us the opportunity to roll, to rule, all right? So you've got a pass that is possessed, um, either in the field of play, or in, uh, in the end zone. Now, here we rule that the pass is possessed at the one yard line and the defender pulls the defensive back into the goal line. So we rule forward progress at the one yard line. And that's probably the correct ruling here um, because it, it appears that clearly this pass is uh, intercepted in the field of play and we end up with um, the forward progress spot at the one. If there is question in terms of where possession is firmly controlled, that whole process of the catch, and he ends up in the end zone, the ruling could be that this would be a touchback. Here, this is it appears to be the correct ruling that he's clearly in the field of play that without the defensive player pulling him down, he probably makes a move up the sideline on a return because he's going essentially parallel with the goal line. If he is going at an angle towards the end line, 
then it's quite possible that the correct ruling here by philosophy would have been touchback. Hopefully you can see the difference there. We have a parallel situation, a parallel universe, if you will, with the defensive back running parallel with the goal line, and then clearly the receiver pulls him back into the end zone. If this was a little more of like a fade route, then probably the correct ruling would have been touchback just because of the movement of the players and when this process of the catch is completed. But nice job by the deep wing being at goal line extended. All right, next clip. All right, this should be 85. All right, what we're going to get, this is a five-person game, but uh, the concept we want to apply here. First of all, back judge is probably a little short on this, whether it's five or seven. Would like to see that cushion be another five yards or so deep. Sometimes back judges, we misjudge our cushion because we see the great distance between us and the players. We have to remember that the cushion is based on where the players are in terms of north and south rather than east and west. So here we're at about four to five yards when we should be seven to ten. All right, so we pull this up a little quick, um, but we're in the center of the field, which is good. And now you'll see what happens is that the defense back intercepts the pass. Now, the back judge backs it up, so he's not going to be in the way of the return, but sometimes you have players there. And the last thing we want to have happen in this situation, back judges, is for players to get behind you, All right. So that's another good reason why you want to be deep. Distance is your friend, All right? So um, he stays behind it allows the return to go, and the player's tackled. Now, jump to the next clip, which is the end zone view. Here's what I like about what the back judge did on this particular play. And again, it, it applies whether it's five or seven. So he's out of the way, lets this play develop. He's working ahead. Runner goes down. You don't see him racing up there. He's not rushing the stage to get to this dead ball spot. We're going to put it on a yard line. Uh, team B that just intercepted the pass, they're happy they got the ball. They don't care whether we put it at the 46 or the 47. They got the ball. So he stays back, allows the play to finish, watches the players around the dead ball spot. And in seven, we would have our deeps come up and get a forward progress spot. That's how we should be doing this. All right, next clip. All right, now this is gonna be a pass that's gonna go to the bottom of the screen. Now, uh, hold it, Gregor, back it up a little bit. There are a couple of things we need to remember. Uh, stop it, right? First of all, for us to have OPI, there are a few things that have to happen. First of all, a legal forward pass has to cross the line. But the second piece, the, the first one is the obvious one. If it doesn't cross the line, we know that players can block, all right? But the second piece that often gets overlooked, and frankly, I didn't talk about it this summer, is that the blocking action has to be discernibly beyond the neutral zone. And what we're going to get here is we're going to get a pass that is right near the neutral zone, and the block is also going to be very close to the neutral zone. So now let it run. So the short wing has to be prepared to provide two pieces of information, which is unusual. You know, normally blocks are discernibly behind or ahead. In this particular case, the deep wing or the back judge may need to come in and say, not only do I need to know about the pass, but I need to know about the block. So short wings have got to be prepared to provide that information on both parts. Here, this appears to be a legal play. 
pass is caught at or behind the line of scrimmage. And of course, we want to make sure that it's discernibly beyond the line if we're going to rule one or both of these pieces. So uh, from our vantage point, without being able to look literally down the line, it appears that both were at or behind the neutral zone. So when you talk with your short wings this week, there's something to add to it, you know, might need to know if the block is uh, beyond the neutral zone or in the neutral zone or behind it, um, because it, it could dramatically change the ruling. And of course, when in doubt, we're gonna put the flag down, we're gonna come in and ask our questions. And then uh, based on the answers, we may have to take information to the referee that results in a flag pickup. Okay, next clip. I believe this should be number 19. Yep. All right. Now, here we've got a punt that is going from about the minus 40. Now, absent um, a big wind, typically we're not thinking that necessarily the goal line uh, would be in play. In this particular case, it was. And our back judge and our two deeps got uh, back to the goal line. Now, you can see that we're having a discussion, and I wish that the video was closer so that we could see the details of their conversation. But what, in effect, we have here is that our deep wing is ruling that this, this ball was down legally in the field of play, and the back judge's opinion is that he did not have firm control of the ball prior to the time that the ball broke the plane of the end zone. And after consultation, uh, they ended up going with a touchback. Now, the point of all, it, well, two points. Number one, that's why we have two people at the goal line that are bracketing this play is we're going to get two looks. We're going to get the inside out and we're going to get the outside in. All right. So uh, that's why the first thing we do is to stop the clock. We don't immediately go to this. We stop the clock. And then we look at each other, and if necessary, we confer. So after confirmation uh, and consultation, we got this right. Now, the, the other piece of this is, if you remember, again, back during the summer, we talked about catch, no catch. We talked about the process, uh, not only of catch, no catch, but what you have to do to legally recover a ball. And by the way, we got a play coming up here that involves the sideline. But in this particular instance, for this to be legally down in the field of play, uh, team A must have firm control of the ball before it breaks the plane of the goal line. This is not like the NFL where you can't have a body part in the end zone. None of that stuff applies. It's all based on where the ball is when it's controlled, all right? So in this particular case, um, the back judge, uh, and it, the person that gave me the clip was the, the deep wing. And he said he was absolutely right. This ball was not firmly controlled uh, in the field of play, and the correct judgment was to make this a touchback, which is what it turned out to be. So several good things there. First of all, a reminder about our punt mechanics near the goal line. Secondly, um, our communication and how important it is to put two heads together and really talk it through to come up with the right outcome. And then the third piece, applying firm control as we would any other place on the field. All right, next clip. This is going to be a foul selection situation, and there are two potential holds that we're going to have. Um, so that's part of it. And then what we're going to end up with is a play out of bounds. So there it is. There's the, the first piece of it. All right. So from a mechanical standpoint, um, it appears that we're double-double. So let's see, this is uh, play number 46. So this is first half. So initially, um, do I have that right? No. Okay, what we have, we have uh, two receivers to the bottom of the screen. So the back judge is going to have this wing back, 
right? And the deep wing is going to have the wide receiver. All right, so back judge is going to be primary for this first block near the hash. So we'll take a look at that first. We come out, pretty good leverage, maintains contact, can't see what happens inside with the hands in terms of was it a grab or restrict. Hopefully the back judge would have a look at that, but we might also get some help from our short wing that might get a look at it. We might even get a little bit of help from potentially our umpire. But again, remember, this is not a safety foul. So we want to make sure that if we're going to ring this up as a foul, that it's got to be one of those that the grandma in the top row says, yep, that was holding. Okay, so let's look at the block at the bottom of the screen. Comes up, forms him up, pulls him, maybe pushes him to the inside. I don't have that as a foul. I just have that as a dominant block by the wide receiver. Um, gets out, forms him up, is able to turn him, and good job by the wide receiver. All right, so part three of this now is the contact that's made out of bounds or near the sideline. All right, so... First guy gets him, and we can't really see the feet of the runner, so we've got to somewhat use our imagination here. Let's say that the runner has one foot down out of bounds. Now, he's still moving basically north and south. It's not like he's turned and now he's running 90 degrees to the sideline. So he's trying to gain additional yardage. So if it's one foot down in the white and we have contact, we're going to judge that as being okay, no foul. If the second foot is down, down, out of bounds, then that contact becomes suspect. Here, what you're going to see, whether by good fortune or otherwise, uh, the running back does not lose his feet. So correct judgment here, not calling a UNR late hit out of bounds. And again, we don't know for sure exactly where his feet were. But what we're looking for is someone to lose their feet and to be in a dangerous position. Clearly, that's not the case here. This young man may have more contact than that on the bus ride home. Well, actually, it's a home game, so uh, he's probably not riding the bus, but you get the point. So this should be a talk to, to number three of the defense. Hey, you know, that guy loses his feet. That's 15 on you. You got to be more aware of where he is. Okay. All right. Next clip. This is an unusual situation. This is on a PAT. We don't see this real often. Right in the middle of the formation, we're going to have a player uh, do a son of Sam uh, leapfrog of sorts that's going to go right over uh, linemen that are uh, in a three point stance. Hurdles over. I believe it was the snapper, all right? Uh, we don't see that often. That's a foul for hurdling. So options for team A. They can take half the distance to the goal, repeat the try, or they can enforce this U and R uh, on the succeeding kickoff. In this particular case, the kicking team elected to have it enforced on the succeeding kickoff. You don't see it often. Uh, try to prevent that inside. You can see we have the umpire and we have the side judge. When you see a guy that is not on the line of scrimmage, you can kind of tell what they have in mind, or you can even be preventative and say, hey, don't even think about hurdling over anybody. You know, let them know you're watching. Try to prevent that kind of a foul. All right, next clip. All right, we're going to get a play that's going to go to the top of the screen. It's it's going to be a pass near the sideline. Catch there. Now, whether that, however that's intended to be, uh, how it was ruled on the field was that this was a bat. All right? Um, and we're not going to have a kill shot. We're too far away to really see it. Uh, what I suspect happened here, though, is that the receiver was able to get enough of the control that in effect what he did was in basketball, trying to save the ball back over his head from going out of bounds. 
Well, the, the interpretation that we had in basketball was if you're in control enough to be able to flip the ball back from it going out of bounds, you are in control of the ball. So if that is indeed the case, then what we would have would be what we used to call a forward lateral. It would be a second pass, which would be an illegal forward pass and would be enforced from the spot of the foul somewhere in the vicinity of looks like about the 44. Unusual play, uh, maybe one of those that we would need to talk about after the play. Um, that just doesn't look quite right. You might want to consult with, uh, you know, if you're the short wing, you might want to consult with the deep wing. Umpire might have uh, an opinion. This is one that we probably want to shut the game down and have some conversation about it uh, rather than leaving that judgment solely to one person that is not totally confident what exactly happened. Okay. So good crew, crew communication opportunity. All right, um, next clip. This is going to be um, a late hit out of bounds. What we wanna talk about is how we get this, right? So this is the quarterback. Now, the first guy, I'm okay with what the first guy did. It's the second guy that comes in and cleans this up. Now, notice that this runner, who also happens to be the quarterback, is not only out of bounds, but he's facing back to the field. Okay? This is a conscious choice on the part of this second guy. All right? There isn't anything here. This guy is not in a position where he's going to gain any more yardage. He just plops this guy. So um, we need to, and not just because it's the quarterback, it certainly doesn't hurt the case for making this a UNR, but regardless which running back or what offensive player this would be, this is a foul and a foul that we want to get down, All right? So that's piece one. So from the standpoint of the deep wing on this side of the field, we should be recognizing this is a play going out of bounds. We should recognize that we have opponents into the other bench. This is a this is about as high a priority as we're going to get. All right. We got a potential foul against the quarterback. We got the opponents into the bench. What possibly could go wrong, right? but we don't get the presence of our deep wing coming up to support this play. And we've talked about this uh, not only during the preseason, but periodically during the year. And that is that we need to make dead ball prioritization almost on every play. And here, like I say, it doesn't get any higher than this. So we should see that deep wing coming up for two reasons. Number one, perhaps asking the short wing why he doesn't have a foul. But number two, to help bring this, these players from, from Team B uh, back to the field. So without incident, hopefully. So opportunities to learn from that on, on both ends of it. Now, back judges, if you see that deep wing coming up full full bore, you're saying, all right, he's not going to be able to help me much with what's happening on this third of the field. And that's where you got to step up and recognize your vision needs to get even wider. And now you're really looking for that guy that's coming with bad intentions so that we don't end up with yet another problem that occurs, you know, uh, that we can avoid. All right. Um, want to look at another foul selection situation. We're looking to see if something is taken away from this player. What we're going to get is a run inside the tackle. Now, you're probably saying, Rich, why are you showing a play involving the referee in the short wing to the deep three? It illustrates a point that hopefully was partially made earlier, and that is a lot of times whether something is a foul or not is based on what the runner does. If that runner goes outside as opposed to going inside, that probably isn't a foul. 
But when he chooses to cut it up inside, then the blocker loses his leverage and his only, uh, his only choices are to let the guy go to make the tackle or to hold on to him to prevent him from doing so and he takes him to the ground. So as we're looking at this from a deep wing perspective or anywhere on the field, we also have to look at what the runner does in terms of the leverage that either is maintained or lost uh, on the part of the blocker. So that's why that clip is in there. All right, um, this is gonna be the last clip of, of the night. And I saved it for last on purpose. What we're gonna get is a, well, okay, there are two more. Um, this is the other possession play um, that we talked about earlier. Let's run it back from the beginning of the clip. All right, now you've probably seen some teams that that do some version of this. It's for a purpose, and this is what it is. They come up there and pretend like they're going to do that short kick. And then what they do is try to catch, see, you've got one of the team B players, 67, who had his back, had no idea what was going on. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get team A to relax. See? And now there it goes, all right? So now the, the race is on to try to get over there. Now, we can't be surprised as uh, umpire, back judge, and field judge, side judge, we can't be surprised. We've talked about that, that nausea, the fact that every free kick is a short kick until it's not. Um, and then we also have the aspect of the recovery uh, is the recovery legally made in the field of play? Now, uh, just like on a catch, once we have firm control of the ball, if the catching player or the recovering player maintains control of the football through the entire process, they can bring it into their body, they can slide out of bounds. But as soon as that ball gets juggled, as soon as firm control of the ball is lost, it's an incomplete pass, or if that was the case over on the sideline, this would be a kick out of bounds untouched by Team B. It'd be a five-yard foul. So another example of knowing our rules, knowing our principles in terms of recoveries that go along with the catching process philosophy, all right? Have to be alert. If we're not anticipating the situation, we're in a heap of trouble, all right? All right, last clip of the night. What we're going to get is a catch, no catch, and it's going to go to the end zone. And this is, this is, that's not the play. This should be um, 161. All right, here we go. What we're going to get is a, either a catch, no catch. It's right up the seam. Now we're going to get two views of this, all right? So you can take your initial reading off of this. Now, while we're looking at this yet again, let's look at it from the, the, first, uh, the first view. Remember, we've talked continuously about being able to do something common to the game before we're going to have the process completed and before it's even possible for a player to fumble the ball. So now let's go to the second view that is a little more um, zoned in on what happens here. Now this is tight. And the ruling on the field was that this was a catch fumble uh, for a touchback, all right? This clearly would be reviewed if this happened at Ford Field. That would be reviewed by whoever, you know, was up in the booth. Now, if you look at this carefully, what you're going to see is that the player gets firm control of the ball, but does not have the opportunity to bring it all the way into his body before it's scraped out of there by the defensive back. This happens boom, boom, okay? So no fault of the crew coming to that decision 
but see the bean bag goes down in the field of play. Um, and then we, you can see if you run it back a little bit further, you can see that the, the deep wing at the top of the screen looks like to me, he initially comes in and wants to make this incomplete. Watch the, the deep wing at the top of the screen. First of all, we, we need to be on the goal line. All right. Watch his arms. See, he's going incomplete. He's going incomplete. And now he comes in there and the back judge is saying, I got that a fumble for a touchback. And then he goes, okay, all right. Well, first of all, that's not the Federation touchback signal, but we end up ruling as a touchback. Now, I want to say once again, what a tough, tough uh, judgment decision that is. That was a bang, bang play. Uh, but if you look at it from the standpoint of when in doubt, wipe it out, this is an incomplete pass. Tough play. Tough, tough play. And of course, we got to finish the play. Regardless of what we rule, we got to finish the play by uh, getting back and ruling what happens on the recovery and potentially the end line. So some good plays tonight. Gregor, you can stop the video. Um, <clears throat> Hopefully there's a nugget here or there that uh, you can take back to your crew and will help you this week or sometime uh, during the remainder of the season. Uh, just a reminder that once again, we'll stick with our Monday meeting format at seven o'clock on that would be September 30th. Um, so mark your calendars accordingly. And if you can't make it live, we will continue to, to, um, put out the recording accordingly. Um, keep working hard. You know, that's all I can really say is, is go into every game as if it's the state championship game, regardless of the records of the teams. We've got to prepare for these games uh, so that we bring our best effort every night that we step out onto the field. Uh, stick up for each other, communicate, help each other. Um, Try not to let a brother or sister get stuck with uh, a, a decision that we can fix on the field. Don't be afraid to talk about it. You know, we're not looking for long conferences. We're not looking for uh, lots of conferences, but there's a time when it's absolutely necessary. And the important thing is that we get it right. So uh, keep working hard. Uh, we're, we're now entering the second half of the season. There's still a lot on the line. If you need some motivation, decisions are going to have to be made about what crews are assigned to crossover games. Um, and that'll be based on seating and, and how your performances have gone this season. So uh, there's still plenty on the line from every point of view, including your own, in terms of what game you would end up with at the end of the year if you're involved in one of the crossover games. So um, take care, travel safely, have fun. You know, this, this is supposed to be about having fun. I'll just tell you, it's a whole lot more fun when you're doing it well and you really enjoy the camaraderie of, you, of the other officials on the field. So with that, we'll say good night and um, have a, a wonderful time out on the field this week and get them right.